origination topic today. Um, for so those of us who have been doing this for some time, um, this was all we used to do, which were just these sort of um, origination issues and you know what we once called predatory lending terms. And so there are some newer rules that have come out that allow us to kind of go back to those days and really look at how are these loans originated. And when you find these types of violations, you can get some um, really strong remedies for your clients. And so I'm very happy to have uh, Justin Haynes with Legal Services of NYC Bronx and Aisha Baruni from Queens Legal Services to talk about issues that might arise with FHA loans. So thank you both. Thanks. Um, uh, I would say that the genesis for this training really came from the fact that um, after subprime lending went away, there's been a tremendous growth in FHA loans. I know in uh, the Bronx where I practice, it went from, uh, I believe, uh, like 9% of the loans originated were FHA loans to, in recent years, being closer to 50% of new loans being FHA loans. And with that, um, we know that there, you know, for reasons that we'll explain, that this program can be abused um, to, to give people unaffordable loans. and um, it can also be used to flip really shoddy houses that um, may have gone through foreclosure, and they slap some paint on them and resell them to a new purchaser. Um, and there are particular rules around FHA loans that may uh, prevent some of that abuse. Um, and we want people to be vigilant about what's happening in their community. Um, since this program is very important to, to give a lot of people entrance into home ownership um, that they otherwise wouldn't have gotten um, we have to preserve the program, but also be aware of all, all of its failings as well. Aisha, do you want to say anything? Just a quick word about the materials. Today, um, during the webinar, we'll be going through the PowerPoint and a short PDF that you received. You also should have received a very long outline, a Word document. Um, we're not going to go through that whole outline today. That's for your reference. It has many more details than we could fit in an hour-long webinar, including a lot of citations. So please refer to that um, as cases come up or in following up today if you want to think about these issues more. And the, the last thing I will say is that this, when Ayesha and I originally did this um, training, it was over two, it was around two hours. We've tried to cut it down and fit it into an hour, and I apologize if for some reason we do go over a little bit. Um, we're going to try and keep it to an hour. That being said, uh, let's get started. Um, some of the things that we're going to cover today are how does FHA insurance work, um, what some of the basic FHA underwriting guidelines are, go into the FHA anti-property anti flipping rules. Um, uh, we'll hopefully give you some tips about identifying and researching bad lenders, go through some of the most common violations of FHA underwriting standards, uh, talk very briefly about FHA underwriting and how um, the False Claims Act or KETAM actions have been brought to address um, sort of wide-scale uh, fraud in the program, and then um, talk in a little bit of detail about possible defenses for faulty underwriting on specific cases, individual cases. So how does FHA insurance work? Um, the program is actually quite old. It goes back to 1934. And FHA insures home mortgages um, uh, lent by private lenders against the possibility of the borrower defaulting. And when it, how it works is when the borrower defaults, FHA will pay the lender the remaining principal amount plus any fees and allowable costs. Um, since lenders will be made whole if a borrower defaults and thus bears uh, little to no risk, FHA insurance encourages lenders to expand access to the mortgage credit to mortgage credit to riskier borrowers. But for that same reason, the system can be abused since the lender bears no risk for bad loans it originates, which is similar to the abuse that we saw during the subprime crisis where um, they knew they you know originating a loan, they knew they were going to sell it instantly and not bear risk if it was underwritten poorly. Um, same fear exists around FHA since the government's going to pay them back. There's going to be no loss to the borrower, uh, to the lender. Um, so all the rules for FHA loans exist in part in regulations, in the Code of Fed, Fed, Federal Regulations, and um, also in HUD handbooks and mortgagee letters. So the handbooks are, um, they're moving into, a, uh, they're, they're in the process right now of developing one master handbook that encapsulates all the programs related to FHA. 
Previous to that, there's about 10 different handbooks, um, and they can all be found on HUD's website. And those old handbooks get updated periodically by mortgagee letters. So some basics about FHA loans. Um, they can be used um, for one to four unit properties that are used at least 50% for residential purposes. Um, the loan limits are, are very generous, um, at least in New York City. I mean, it depends on, you have to look up, there's a county by county um, list. Um, and in New York, it's quite generous. So for a single family home, I think it goes up to 750000 And for up to a four family, it's, some, it's over a million dollars. So um, they can be large loans. Um, there are limits on the loan to value. Um, there has to the, the absolute um, limit is 96.5% loan to value, meaning that there's a 3.5% borrower contribution to that purchase, um, and that's really for people with credit scores of 580 and above. For people with credit scores between 500 and 579, the maximum is 90% loan to value, meaning they have to do a 10% down payment uh, contribution. The loans um, have a maximum of 30 years, but actually they can be like 29 years, 27 years. There's no prescribed um, duration for a FHA loan. And um, although I've mostly encountered fixed FHA loans, there can be ARM FHA loans, but there are a lot more restrictions on the ARMS. Um, they can't have abusive features. And overall, in a, in a given year, ARMS can only um, represent 30% of all the insured loans. So the majority of FHA loans are going to be fixed interest loans. Um, and the other uh, common uh, basic is that the borrower's front end and back end DTI um, for no credit score, or if you have a low credit score, meaning between 500 and 579, is going to be a 31% front end and a 43% back end. And if you have a higher credit score of 580 and above, it can be 40% uh, front end and 50% back end but there have to be multiple compensating factors present. And those compensating factors are described in the handbook. But this might be surprising to people because you can have a relatively small down payment of 3.5%, and you can have either no traditional credit, um, and I'll go into that in a little detail, or a very low credit score. I mean, between 500 and 579 is considered quite low. Another feature of how FHA insurance works is that there's this fund called the Mutual Mortgage Insurance Fund, and that's what's used to pay out the claims on defaulted loans. And how they um, fill that, that pot of money in the insurance fund is paid exclusively by borrowers um, who pay, um, make payments into that fund called uh, mor through mortgage insurance premiums, or MIP. Um, and they pay twice. Borrowers pay into the fund at closing with an upfront payment as well as an annual premium paid monthly. Both MIP payments represent a percentage of the total loan amount. The upfront MIP um, went from 1% to 1.75% of the loan, uh, and that, began, that ha change happened in April 2012. And it really, and you'll see um, FHA costs really went up um, around, two, uh, around 2012, mainly because there was a lot of fear that with all the defaulting loans that they were going to, the whole loan was going to be mutual mortgage insurance fund was going to be completely exhausted by all the people defaulting on FHA loans. So that to raise that money, they, they bumped things up. And at that same, around the same time, the annual MIP went from 0.9% um, to its height in April 2013, where it went to 1.35%. But very recently, in January of 2015, it went back down lower than it was before to 0.85%. And just to give an illustration of what those numbers really mean, for a $300,000 um, home purchase, the loan would be, with a 3.5% um, down payment, would be uh, $289,500. The upfront MIP would be about $5,066.25 at closing. And the annual MIP under, at the highest, would have been $325.69 a month. But now it's down to around $205.06 monthly. So under the FHA um, lending program um, for single-family homes, there are two programs. There's an older program called direct endorsement. And direct endorsement lenders may underwrite the loans that either they originate or that are originated by other lenders or correspondents. So a correspondent might collect all the 
paperwork from the borrower, but they can't do the actual underwrite, underwriting. The underwriting has to be handled by someone who's given, given direct endorsement authority from FHA. Um, and F, you know, those direct endorsement lenders are annually certifying that they're going to follow all the FHA rules. Um, and their performance is monitored. Um, but it's, it's a very loose um, system. It's not like regulators are, are looking at every single FHA loan that gets made. So it works by a direct endorsement lender, applies for an FHA case number using a computer system called FHA Connect web portal. Um, after the lender underwrites and closes the loan, they submit um, what's called a case binder to one of the FHA home ownership centers. Um, and the case binder really is a collection of a subset of the closing documents. Um, and at the home ownership center, they're going to be looking for compliance. Um, and uh, if everything looks good, then they if issue the FHA insurance. There's a newer program that started in 2006, um, and this is called the Lender Insurance Program. And under this, mortgagees additionally can not only just do all the review and underwriting, but they can also insure the loan um, themselves. And in, in the Lender Insurance Program, only a subset of case binders are going to be submitted, and they're going to be submitted not in paper form, but in electronic form. And lenders who are direct endorsement lenders become eligible for the lender insurance status if they have an unconditional direct endorsement approval, meaning they haven't been found to have really done anything and put them on probation, um, and also that they have a two-year claim rate and default rate that does not exceed 150% of the claim and default rates for the states in which they've underwritten loans previously. So the two-year claim rate and the default rate are ways that FHA monitors a lender's performance and, and raises red flags if they exceed certain, certain benchmarks. And under the lender insurance program, HUD is monitoring um, quarterly rather than just annually. So some of the ways that they monitor for bad lending is um, based on these lenders saying, yes, we're going to follow all these rules, and um, we're going to adhere to the rules and regulations. Um, and then as part of the rules, lenders are supposed to have a quality control plan that involves reviewing loans that have defaulted in six months or less. Um, so those are considered early defaults. And they're also supposed to pull a random sampling of loans um, to review. And then when they discover that there are material violations of the rules, they're supposed to um, inform HUD right away um, of any you know, serious violations, or if they've discovered any kind of fraud taking place. Um, for the direct for lenders that are in the direct endorsement program, some loan level quality assurance is being done by the home ownership centers. But keep in mind, there's only four home ownership centers in the whole country. So, and there's many loans, um, so they're not really looking at every single thing very carefully. Um, and to become a direct endorsement lender, Really, you have to, you know, there's certain asset requirements, but in terms of performance, you really only have to have an acceptable performance rating on 15 loans. So it's quite, kind of easy for people to become um, FHA lenders. And you'll see, like, these are being, um, many FHA lenders are small entities that you may not have heard of before. Um, and then ongoing monitoring continues throughout um, the lending process. Through their you know, home ownership centers are supposed to do occasional on-site evaluations. They do desk audits of insured loans, and then something that Aisha is going to talk about in more detail is something called Credit Watch, which is really monitoring default rate um, on loans. And then there's an entity called the Mortgage Review Board um, that can take administrative actions against um, uh, bad lenders and suspend or terminate their lending authority. So we'll jump into the underwriting guidelines. Um, the purposes of FHA mortgage credit analysis is really to determine a borrower's ability and willingness to repay a mortgage debt um, and to limit the probability of default and collection actions. And they also want to examine the property offered as security to make sure that it's sufficient collateral and just really to limit you know, the collection actions and foreclosures. And they're going to look at the four C's of credit, uh, which include credit history, capacity to repay the loan, cash assets available to close the mortgage, and the collateral. Some just general requirements. I mean, 
keep in mind that these um, underwriting guidelines are in handbooks that are hundreds of pages long. So these are real generalizations that we're making today. Lenders may not have borrowers sign any documents in blank, um, incomplete documents, or blank sheets, sheets of paper. The mortgage loan application package must contain all documentation that supports the lender's decision to approve the mortgage loan. When the standard documentation does not provide enough information to support that approval decision, the lender must provide additional explanatory statements that are consistent with the information in the application and must clarify or supplement the documentation submitted by the borrower. In, at closing, all the documents that they're relying on have to be less than 120 days old. And there is a system, a computerized underwriting system called TOTAL, which stands for Technology Open to Approved Lenders. And for all, um, uh, for all underwriting cases, except for cases where someone doesn't have a traditional credit score, they're supposed to use this total mortgage scorecard. Um, and you know, it, it, it spits out different um, ratings. It can be accept, um, which means that they have a high enough credit score and they've met all the underwriting guidelines. Or it can be refer, which means that it needs to be manually underwritten. Just so that you're familiar, uh, if, you're, if you were to pull, uh, you know, you're investigating a case and you want to see what should be in um, the, the loan file for an FHA loan, here are all the documents that should be in the loan file, um, including the Fannie Mae um, Uniform Residential Loan Application. There's a HUD addendum for FHA loans. There's supposed to be a FHA loan underwriting transmittal summary, evidence of a Social Security number, credit reports. Uh, verification of deposit, verification of employment, tax returns, sale contracts, um, verification of a rent or payment history, um, total scorecard, accept or approve recommendation, the uniform residential appraisal report, and any explanatory statements. In terms of income, um, a lender must obtain a verification of employment. Um, so the underwriting here is more detailed um, probably than traditional credit. Um, or traditional lending. Um, and there's a lot of very specific rules about how people came up with the money that they have to close the loan and as their, um, their down payment. Um, and so there should be a lot of documentation in FHA loan, including this verification of employment. And um, in addition to that, calling up the employer and finding out, you know, confirming that the person is still employed. Um, the borrower also must have the recent pay stub that shows the year-to-date earnings of at least one month, and like I said, the ver there has to be a verbal verification of employment. They have to really look at the last two years of employment, and if there's any gaps in employment that lasted one or more months, that has to be explained in a letter. Um, they must also determine whether the income level that the borrower has will continue through the first three years of the loan. And um, Income stability takes precedence over job stability, and what that means is that, say a person has had three different jobs in the last two years, as long as the income remains the same or increases, um, that's more important um, than the fact that they switch jobs. If a borrower has a 25% or greater ownership interest in a business, that they are going to be considered self-employed for underwriting purposes. And of course, just like with modifications, there's a lot of rules about self-employed borrowers and the documentation that they need to see including tax returns um, from both the company and the borrower. And then, like with modifications, there's a lot of different rules about the other types of income that could be considered, but you know, there are rules about overtime, seasonal, commission income, social security, pensions, VA disability income, alimony, child support, military income. And um, they also have Section 8 home ownership vouchers um, that can be used to get an FHA loan rental income and investment income. And you know it would take years to go through all the different rules um, that exist for different income. One really interesting thing about FHA loans is that um, although acceptable credit is required, a loan cannot be rejected due to a lack of credit. Meaning there are some people out there who just have never had access to credit, don't have traditional credit lines, um, like credit cards or car loans or student loans. and um, in those cases, they can't reject the loan just because someone doesn't have a credit score. They actually have to um, document an attempt to develop a satisfactory history of non-traditional credit. Um, and let me see if it's this slide. I go into the next slide. Um, 
But loans with a credit score below 620 and a debt to income ratio in excess of 43% must be manually underwritten. They can't rely on the total scorecard. <coughs> a borrower is not eligible if their credit score is below 500. And for scores between 500 and um, 579, like I said before, it requires a 10% down payment, and the LTV is 90, 90%. Um, if you have a higher credit score, you can have a lower down payment of 3.5%. If the total scorecard is accepted or approved, borrower need not provide any explanation of adverse credit or derogatory info, but there needs to be proof that judgments are satisfied. If the total scorecard is referred, the borrower must provide an explanation for major indicators of derogatory credit and any minor indications within the past two years. The lender has to document the credit analysis, and for any derogatory items, it must determine if the late payments were based on different factors, including a disregard for financial obligations, inability to manage debt, or if it was factors beyond the borrower's control, things like the mail came late and that's why someone was 30 uh, days late, or if there's some kind of dispute with a creditor. Again, the non-traditional credit, um, these references have to be documented carefully. Um, they cannot be used to enhance the credit of borrowers with a poor payment history or to offset derogatory credit found on a traditional credit report, such as collections and judgments. It is designed to assess the credit history for borrowers about the types of trade lines that normally appear on a credit report. And some of the sources of credit references include rental pay housing payments, which is information from a landlord, utility company references, insurance premiums that are not automatically payroll deducted, child care payments made to businesses in school tuition. So other important bills that might show a, a good payment history for important things. There's other requirements. Um, it should at least have a minimum of three sources and should have a 12-month history for these non-traditional references. Um, there can be no history of delinquent housing payments and no more than one time 30-day um, late on a consumer debt. There can be no collection accounts or public record reporting in the past 12 months. Um, this uh, was stated earlier, but a borrower generally cannot have a back-end uh, liability that exceeds 43% unless the credit score is above 580 and there are compensating factors which raise the limit to 47 or 50% with two factors. Um, things like prior foreclosure, bankruptcy, and short sales, there are a lot of rules around those, but generally they're not a problem if enough time has passed and someone has reestablished their credit. Um, they have to generally be about two or three years in the past. So there are very specific asset rules, and the asset rules come into play for four uh, different things. One, the minimum required investment, or the MRI, um, which for most people is going to be 3.5% to 10%. The earnest money deposit, which is not as big a thing in New York as it is in other jurisdictions. Um, and ca cash to close the account or close at uh, the loan at, at the closing. And then um, there also is an, a reserve requirement. Once upon a time, it was just for multifamily. It's now um, a requirement for um, all, all FHA loans. And depending on the size of the home, you have to show one to three months uh, of ability in the future to pay the mortgage um, and reserves in, in, in a bank account. Like I said before, HUD has very specific source of fund rules for FHA loans, especially if, if, if it's gift funds or secondary financing, meaning that um, there are sometimes are first-time home buyer programs out there that are offered by different states, and um, they'll give people that down payment assistance. Um, there's a lot of rules about who can make those um, sort of loans and what kind of documentation um, can exist. Even a gift from a family member has to be documented in a letter um, that says that you know the money came, was given by this person, their relationship to you, when it occurred, etc. Um, there are acceptable asset sources if people have cash, savings, investment or retirement accounts, collateralized loans, secondary financing and gift funds. Um, you know, this is what I was saying about the letters. It, um, if it's a gift, the donor's name, their address, their phone number, the relationship between the donor and borrower, the dollar amount when the gift was given, will be given, a language that certifies that there's no repayment required. Minimum required investment funds cannot come from the seller of the property or any other person who financially benefits from either directly or indirectly. Um, 
or that someone who's involved in a financial transaction who's going to be reimbursed. So you can't sort of fake it by like having you know, the seller or the broker say, you know, you don't have the down payment here, let me give you the money and you pay me back later or something like that. Um, they really want to make sure that the, that the borrower has some level of investment in this loan. There's also appraisal rules about um, the collateral that's going to be used. Lenders must use appraisers from FHA approved lists. To be on the list, the appraisers have to be licensed by the state. You can't be on any derogatory watch lists and they have to have passed the test on FHA appraisal rules, which are fairly extensive. The, um, the appraiser is hired by the lender, but it's for the benefit of both the lender and HUD, but not the purchaser. It's always recommended that someone have their own, um, uh, what's the word, um, not appraisal, what? Inspector. Inspector, yes. Have their own inspector who's there for their benefit to tell them what might be wrong with a home. Um, and, and you'll see there's different forms that they sign that, that informs them that they should have their own inspector and that you know potentially could be used against them um, for not hiring an inspector. Um, although an FHA appraisal is both interior and exterior and must identify any conditions or structural or mechanical that endanger the health and safety of its occupants, it is not a detailed inspection and is recommended that the purchaser still get their own. Appraiser can identify required repairs that must be completed in order to close the loan. A property with defective conditions is unacceptable until the defects or conditions have been remedied and the probability um, of further damage is eliminated. And defective conditions include defective construction, poor workmanship, evidence of continuing settlement, excessive dampness, leakage, decay, termites, and also other readily observable conditions that impair the safety sanitation or structural soundness of the dwelling. All right, we wanted to pause for a second, just if there are any particular questions. Not yet. Great. So Aisha, you're going to... All right, I'll take over. Just a minute. Okay, so what we're going to talk about next are the FHA anti-property flipping rules. I think we've all had clients come into our offices um, who purchased a home with an FHA insured loan and essentially the person who sold it to them flipped it over a pretty short period of time, told our client that they were doing all of this great work on it but didn't do so. Um, it's a known problem, it's a known way that FHA loans are abused and so HUD has made rules to try to curb the use of FHA insured loans to buy properties out of a flip. Um, the rules are modest and they've made exceptions to those, so I'm not sure exactly how effective they've been, but we wanted to give you that information. So the property flipping rules are found in the CFR in the cited section and they've been in effect since May 1st, 2003. The strongest property flipping rule is the 90-day rule. And what the 90-day rule says is that a borrower may not use an FHA-insured mortgage loan to purchase a home if it has been fewer than 90 days since the seller bought it. So the seller buys the home January 1st. A buyer can't use an FHA-insured loan to buy that home until at least 90 days have passed. There's a second rule for a second time frame for the 91 to 180 day time frame. So if a seller purchases a home and wants to sell it to a new buyer, so they flipped it, they want to sell it to a new buyer, um, if they are doing so and it's been 91 to 180 days since that seller bought the home, it is fine to use an FHA insured loan, but if the new purchase price is at least 100% more than the prior purchase price, a second appraisal is required. So seller buys a home in January, flips it, wants to sell it for twice as much within five months. If they do that, a second appraisal is going to be required to justify that increase in price because HUD knows what happens and HUD knows that a lot of times that price increase is not justified. 
So the 90-day rule is obviously stronger because it's a flat prohibition, but HUD in its wisdom has made an exception to the rule. My computer is being a little difficult. So there is a potential waiver of the 90-day rule that was in effect for loans made between February 2010 and the end of last year. The waiver did not get extended for 2015. And not all transactions qualify for the waiver. So the first step for a transaction to qualify for the waiver of the 90-day rule would be for the transaction to happen during that time frame mentioned here. All right. Second step is that the transaction has to be arm's length. And the regulation gives some more definition about what it means to be arm's length. So it, the property needs to be marketed. It can't be sold to somebody who knows the seller. Um, that's not arm's length. And then third here, again, it's a qualification relating to the difference in price. So if the sales price is more than 20% above the seller's purchase price, there needs to be a second appraisal and an actual property inspection in the file. And that is supposed to be protecting, again, HUD, not the seller, um, excuse me, not the buyer, it's to protect HUD um, from insuring a loan that's not supported by the value of the property. Uh, so the 90-day rule, you see there's a wa potential waiver of that 90-day rule. And some transactions are actually even exempt from the 90-day rule altogether. And the list of transactions, they all sound like transactions where there is less potential for flipping abuse. So for example, the sale of inherited property. Um, a buyer can purchase property from a seller who inherited it. Uh, the buyer can purchase that from the seller fewer than 90 days after the seller inherited it and can use an FHA insured loan. There's no prohibition there. All right. So I will maybe just ask now if there are any questions on the property flipping rule because we're going to switch to a different topic. Are there any questions? No, but there was a question that came up about the PMI that I think is straightforward. When does the PMI disappear? Okay. Well, the again, um, it used to be at 78% um, loan to value that the PMI would or the MIP would disappear. Um, they changed that rule when they were raising the rates because they wanted to get the PMI um, for the life of the loan. And now it's actually much more complicated. There's a whole chart about depending on what your credit score was and what the loan to value was. You know, some people's um, MIP will go away at a certain at 78 percent, and others will have to maintain it for the life of the loan. So that is a more complicated answer. You probably you, you could definitely look it up. Um, there's a whole. Uh, it's in one of the mortgagee letters actually that um, from the last couple years that goes through it, um, but it's complicated. Well, so the short answer is there's a chart, and you can refer to it when the issue comes up, right? Yes. <laughs> yes. All right, very good. So that's all we had. Go ahead. OK. Um, so next I want to talk about identifying bad lenders. We've all had the experience of a client coming in with what looks like a pretty bad loan, and you haven't heard of the lender. They're not really known to you in your practice. And so we have some, some tips for investigating a lender to see if other people have had problems with predatory FHA loans by this lender as well. The first step is to take a look and see if that lender is still even approved to make FHA insured loans. FHA publishes a lender list at the URL here. You can also just Google um, FHA lender list, and usually you'll hit it pretty quickly. The list um, has all of the lenders who are approved to make FHA loans. And when you look at the lender's profiles, it'll give you some details about how long they've had that permission and whether they're only uh, approved to make sort of conventional FHA insured loans or whether they're also approved to make um, the FHA insured reverse mortgages. So that's helpful there. Something else, the next step, is you can search the Federal Register for your lender. And the Federal Register publishes the administrative actions that are taken by HUD's Mortgagee Review Board, the MRB, against lenders. Justin mentioned before that the MRB investigates lenders who violate lending requirements. It can take away a lender's ability 
to make FHA insured loans. It can put them on probation. It can find them. And if you, I've, it's very interesting if you go to this and look at some of your problematic FHA lenders, it's interesting to see what the MRB has done. The penalties, in my opinion, um, seem to be a little light. Um, but I think it's helpful when you see, wow, they've already taken some action against this lender before, and maybe it was a light penalty, but my client may be part of a larger pattern with this lender. The next step, just a simple Google search. Uh, with Google searching, I found that particular lenders that I was investigating um, were under investigation by other state finance agencies. Um, press releases from law enforcement about fraud being perpetrated by certain lenders. So it's always helpful, I think, to do a Google search um, when you're investigating as well. The next step is to search HUD's Neighborhood Watch data. It's also called Credit Watch in different places. I don't know why it's called both, um, but now we know it is. So the Neighborhood Watch page is at the URL listed, and what Neighborhood Watch is, is it's a collection of origination, claims, and delinquency information for FHA insured loans that were originated in the past two years, two years only. And what HUD has said is that this data is there to help HUD and FHA staff monitor lenders and track mortgage defaults and claims. So it's the data is collected for the benefit of HUD, but we can use it at least to the extent that it's publicly available. They don't put everything up, but they do have some interesting stuff there. And the data is available on a national, state, or county level. I'm going to show you an example of looking up the data, and you'll see then what I mean by national, state, or county level. So what are you going to be looking for? What HUD looks for in this data what raises a red flag for HUD is when the compare ratio for a lender seems out of whack, seems too high. And what the compare ratio is, is it essentially compares the percentage of a lender's loan to go into a default or claim status. It compares that percentage with the percentage of FHA lenders as a whole. So how does this lender compare to other lenders? only looking at default and claim status, and only looking at the loans that were originated in the last two years. So it's a really small set of information, but it's valuable. And HUD uses a compare ratio higher than 200% as a red flag. So that's what you look for when you're looking at this um, website. So what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to pull up the PDF that was emailed to you. Um, you don't need to pull it up. It's up on your screen now. So we're going to go along with the PDF together, and then we'll switch back to the PowerPoint. Um, you have the PDF as a separate document that was emailed to you, and the correction went out right before we started at noon. And then th this information is also contained in the 80 or whatever page outline that we provided as well. The reason I I printed the screenshots is because the website is sometimes down, and it would be our luck that it would be down um, the day we were trying to do this. So the first step is that you're going to go to the Neighborhood Watch website, and the URL is there. Again, you can also just Google HUD Neighborhood Watch, and that's what you're going to see, except it will be in color. All right, and then you're going to select in the corner here Early Warnings. going to select single lender, and then you'll see here, after you select single lender, it will give you a place to type in the name of your lender. And then that's what you're going to do. Just type in the name of the lender there. I know that everybody's head is now cocked to the left. Um, I could not get it to fit properly the other way, so I'm sorry for the mild discomfort. All right. So what you're going to do next is make your selection. And for the mortgagee, you're going to select the originator by institution. You're just going to search the name of the institution, not a particular branch. You can always break it down to a branch level later. But for today's illustration, we're just going to do the institution. And the delinquent choices, you want to select seriously delinquent. 
and then two-year performance period. These were printed in January, so the last quarter that was available then was the quarter ending at the end of December. So here it was data as of 12-31-2014. You can also search by what are called quarter end dates or by individual quarter, um, but for now we're just going to take a look at the last two years of data. So you tell it to search and then you review the results. You can export this into an Excel spreadsheet, which I recommend doing, because if you don't save it in an Excel spreadsheet, once a quarter goes by, the information subset will have changed and you won't get the same information again because only the last two years of data are available publicly on the website. So you'll see for this lender here that the compare ratio right here is 292%. So it is more than 200%, which would is supposed to raise a red flag for HUD that this lender's compare ratio is higher than it should be. But you see the number here of delinquent and uh, loans and claim status is only seven. So they are small numbers, but HUD is thoughtful about realizing it's about percentages, not just raw numbers. Um, so that should be assigned to you if you're investigating this lender for a client that this lender may be doing something fishy or disproportionately going into default. All right. You can also run the search by county. It defaults to a national search. If you go back, restart your search, early warning single lender, you're doing an originator by institution, seriously delinquent, data as of 12-31-14, and then down here, instead of nationwide totals, which is what it defaults to, you can search by county. If you search by county, you can see that lender's activity in various counties. So you can see here for this lender, the compare ratio in Union, New Jersey is 550%. The Bronx, not that far behind, at 469. These numbers are huge, right? They're much higher than 200%. And then going through some of these counties here. Okay. All right, I'm going to take us back to the PowerPoint. And actually, I'm going to hand it over to Justin now. Um, before I hand it over to Justin, are there any questions about the Neighborhood Watch search or otherwise investigating a bad lender? Not at the moment. OK. Give us just one second while we switch the driver's seat. All right, Justin. So, um, in terms of figuring out, um, that's one we've, we've talked about bad lenders, we've talked about underwriting guidelines, but then sort of the question becomes what are the most common violations of the underwriting guidelines? And there are different places to look. Um, one really significant analysis was done in 2011 by the Office of the Inspector General of HUD. Um, it, was, it was dubbed Operation Watchdog. And what they really found was that um, HUD's current methods of sort of monitoring were not doing a very good job of identifying um, the number, the true number of material deficiencies out there. And what they did is they went and looked at 15 lenders with compare ratios of 200% or higher, which was a total of 284 loans. And they wanted to see, you know, they ranked, um, you know, the, out of those 284, there were 140 that had material deficiencies and nine categories. Um, not all nine are listed here, um, but the most significant ones were. So the biggest problems and underwriting guidelines were around credit history, um, where there was 76 of those loans had problems with the credit history, where maybe there were derogatory, derogatory information that wasn't explained or what have you, but they weren't following the guidelines. Um, 57 cases where the income or employment history um, didn't follow the guidelines, um, 49 cases where they didn't explain something related to the gift funds, um, 36 cases where the qualifying ratios um, were off, 26% um, or tw not 26%, 26 cases where the borrower investment was not properly documented, 24 cases where the liabilities uh, weren't, uh, didn't follow the guidelines, and 20 where the assets were not explained. 
Also, um, there's material out there on HUD's, HUD's website where they're training underwriters and people who work at HUD who look at these loans. And you know, they mention red flags um, that they see on certain documents. So some red flags on credit reports where, where they're looking at a credit report where there's been whiteouts, erasures, or alterations, um, where there could be mismatched personal information. Um, and all or most recent debts, uh, all or most debts recently paid off without proper documentation of the source um, to improve that person's credit report. Um, and then some other documentation red flags um, around income, things like um, handwritten checks, round dollar amounts, missing borrower or employer name, or missing an inaccurate address on the pay stub. So it's clear that there have been cases out there where people supporting documentation is getting you know, falsified in order to qualify for these loans. And then if you look at um, either the MRB findings um, or violations that have been identified um, in cases where uh, different lenders have been sued for not following underwriting guidelines, here are some examples. Um, failure to document the gift and source of funds, source of the gift funds, approving a loan that exceeded acceptable DTI ratios, overstating the borrower's income, using stale credit and debt information, uh, um, understating debts and overstating assets, failure to obtain payment history on, of housing obligations, failure to develop alternative credit histories for borrowers without traditional credit reports, failure to document borrower's cash investment in the property, failure to verify employment, failure to verify source of funds for earnest money deposits, failure to investigate irregularities and mortgage applications for possible fraud. And in, in preparing for this training and doing the research, Aisha and I found that the, the majority of cases that relate to FHA underwriting um, in the body of law out there are related to claims um, made, false claims act claims made against bad lenders. Um, and if you're not familiar with false claims act, it's also sometimes called key TAM. And it's something that, uh, it's a federal law that was developed um, after the Civil War. Um, and it's the government's primary litigation tool for recovering losses resulting from fraud. Um, the False Claims Act imposes civil penalties and treble damages on any person or entity who knowingly makes, uses, or causes to be made or used a false record or statement material to a false or fraudulent claim. So that's the why it's um, relevant to the FHA underwriting um, scenario is that there are multiple certifications that FHA lenders are making. The whole thing is sort of based on this trust that people, that lenders are going to follow the guidelines as they're written. And they annually, I mean, they, they have to certify when they first get set up that, they're, that their branches are going to follow these rules. They annually certify at least four certifications that state, state that they're going to follow the rules and engage in the quality control program. Um, and then where it becomes relevant and actionable is where they said they have followed these rules and they've underwritten these loans, and then the loan defaults, and then the government's going to pay out, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars um, on the unpaid principal balance. Um, but the whole reason why the government is paying that is that they've said that the, they follow the guidelines. And what ends up happening is, you know, there's whistleblowers out there who tip off different entities, or there could be people like us who discover through handling multiple loans of, from a certain lender that a certain lender is not following these rules. And there's some procedural things that are related to False Claims Act. One is that um, the False Claim Act action has to be confidentially filed under seal in the federal district court. Um, and a copy of that complaint with a written disclosure statement of substantially all material evidence and information in the plaintiff's possession must be confidentially served on the US Attorney General and the US Attorney for the district in which the complaint is brought. And then what happens once they've received that, the government has the right to intervene or join in the action. There's this waiting period. If the government declines, the private plaintiff may proceed on his or her own. And why it's significant is that a, a False Claim Act plaintiff can receive between 15 and 30 percent of the total recovery from the defendant, um, whether through a favorable judgment or settlement. So there is large money um, involved in bringing these cases and being a whistleblower. 
Many False Claims Act cases are brought against lenders for not following the FHA underwriting guidelines and other FHA rules. Uh, like I said, they become actionable once the government's paid out the claim. I want to highlight two. Um, they're not necessarily in the, well, one of them's listed here, um, a decision. And, uh, there's two that were brought in the Southern District in the last couple of years. One was against um, Mortgage IT and Deutsche Bank, um, which purchased Mortgage IT in 2007, and one against Wells Fargo. Um, in the Wells Fargo case, um, basically from, you know, the complaint alleges from 2001 to 2005, Wells Fargo was engaged in the reckless origination and underwriting of these loans. Um, in a two-year period from 2001 to 2000, end of 2002, Wells Fargo did 225,000 um, FHA loans. <coughs> As they expanded their FHA loan underwriting, they hired temp underwriters who weren't properly trained in the FHA guidelines. Um, they gave underwriters a bonus based on the number of FHA loans approved, which was this financial incentive to sort of close these loans uh, regardless of whether they met the rules or not. Um, they had a quality control plan, and um, for a period in 2002, their material violation rate never dipped below 42%. So even though they're identifying that there are major violations in all the loans they're originating, they weren't. Um, and they were informing upper management. Upper management wasn't doing anything. <coughs> For loans that defaulted within six months, um, they looked at the violation, material violation rate, which averaged around 66%. And that in one particular month, it hit 90%. So Wells Fargo knew it had a serious problem with the FHA underwriting. And they uh, reported to upper management, but then no changes got made. And, um, and Basically, the government alleged that they failed to report to HUD um, over 6,000 bad loans. For the mortgage IT Deutsche Bank case, um, that for about a 10-year period from 99 to 2009, uh, mortgage IT uh, underwrote 39,000 loans with $5 billion underlying debt. Um, on those loans, HUD paid out $386 million in claims. Um, and the major charge is that they failed to implement a quality control plan. Um, as, you, as we stated earlier, all early defaults that default within six months have to be reviewed. They didn't even know how to identify their defaulting loans. Um, and until it wasn't until 2009, or no, 2005, that they had any personnel to conduct the quality control. And at that time, it was only one person. <coughs> In 2004, they hired an outside vendor to help them with, um, not with the early defaults, but with the general sort of review the random sampling of their loans for quality control. But and this, this vendor was named Tina, T-E-N-A. Um, but then when Mortgage IT was receiving the reports back from Tina, they were just stuffing them all in a closet. And they went unread for almost two years. So obviously, they weren't implementing any changes based on, on the results of their quality control plan. Um, in the Mortgage IT Deutsche Bank case, there was a big settlement. Um, and um, you know, not unlike all other things, Wells Fargo is still fighting the case against them, despite the you know hundreds of thousands of dollars, millions of dollars that um, HUD has paid out on its claims. All right, I'm going to switch back over to you. All right. Okay, so what I want to do next with just the last couple of minutes is talk about the possible defenses for faulty underwriting. Um, the outline that you have has a, a lot, lot more detail about this. I'm just going to touch on this briefly because our hour together is almost up. But as Justin said before, the majority of case law about deficiencies in the origination of FHA insured loans is brought under the False Claims Act and is brought by the U.S. When I was doing research for this, I thought I would still find you know, buckets of cases relating to um, borrowers, borrowers bringing these predatory lending cases against lenders. And there just aren't that many cases out there. But we do, I think, I think it's valuable to think about how we frame the defenses that we already use in predatory lending cases for an FHA lens. So the first step is sort of thinking about the common facts in predatory FHA mortgages. So um, we see inflated appraisals, insufficient income to support the monthly payments, 
insufficient documentation of income or credit. The borrower's income is often miscalculated uh, to be higher, of course, and it often includes an inflated rental income. And sometimes I see clients whose income at the time included imputed rental income um, because the property was represented as being multifamily, and then it turns out the property was only a single family, and it, they qualified using rental income that there's that they don't have a right to collect because it's an illegal unit. Another common fact is um, the borrower exceeds the acceptable debt to income ratios that Justin laid out before for us. So, what I've done in the next two slides is just listed some of the most common predatory lending defenses and the elements and some case examples for you to take a look at and start to think about FHA cases from a predatory lending perspective and how to fit it into these elements here. Um, perhaps the most common would be General Business Law 349, uh, with parties engaged in an act that's deceptive or materially misleading, directed toward consumers, and an individual was injured. Um, what's really nice about GBL 349 is it does not require an intent to defraud or mislead, justifiable reliance, or a pattern of behavior. The case examples I've listed there, the Saucier case, is a case out of D.C. Um, that deals with their UDAP law and specific to an FHA insured loan. So I recommend taking a look at that. And then the other case listed is a Queens County case dealing with GBL, sort of generally not specific to FHA insured loans. Another good potential defense would be common law fraud or aiding and abetting fraud. And the elements of common law fraud are listed there. I think the elements with which we'll have the most difficulty um, for FHA insured loans would be intent to induce reliance and justifiable reliance. An example I saw in a case law, um, in a case was, you know, the judge said that the borrower's allegation that the appraisal was incorrect and that therefore, you know, approval of the loan was tantamount to fraud, the, the court said there that the borrower didn't rely on the appraisal and so couldn't make out a fraud claim based on that. So just, again, thinking about the elements and how we can frame these elements around our FHA insured loans. Next, uh, next three defenses, unconscionability, negligence, and negligence mis negligent misrepresentation. Unconscionability typically has procedural unconscionability plus substantive unconscionability. So how somebody got into this contract plus the substance of the contract. Substance of the contract could be difficult with an FHA insured loan because the substance is usually OK because it meets the regulations. The interest rate is not 30%, for example. Um, that doesn't mean that your client should have been given this loan, that your client can afford this loan. Um, but some of the case law, one of the cases listed there more, deals with an FHA insured loan talking about unconscionability. Some of the case law is not sympathetic to the idea that you could call an FHA insured loan an unconscionable contract if the loan itself looks the way FHA insured loans are supposed to look. The terms of it look like an approved FHA insured loan. And then just next, negligence and negligent misrepresentation. The difficulty here is establishing the duty to your client. Um, typically, somehow, which this is crazy to me, the case law says that um, banks do not have a special duty to borrowers. And so establishing that there was some kind of duty to uh, give your bar, your client all of the information about the loan, for example, the fact that they didn't actually qualify for the loan for which they were being approved. Some of the case law says that's not, you can't establish that duty. So um, it's worth thinking about what facts are in your case that will help you establish that duty. Because without the duty, the rest of the elements of negligence and negligent misrepresentation just really don't matter if you can't establish the duty there. And that's it. This uh, sources of information relates to Justin mentioned during his section 
that about all of the different handbooks that exist right now where he pulled all the information about um, explaining how FHA works, how FHA insurance works, and the underwriting guidelines. These are the different handbooks as they are now, and most of them are supposed to be consolidated into a new single handbook. Um, do you have anything to add, Justin? No, that's, that's it. I mean, the, the new handbook is located here uh, as one of them, um, and then the, all the others are as well, the older ones. Because if you have an older loan, you're going to want to reference the, the handbook and the mortgagee letters that were in effect at that time. So do we have any final questions? We're also happy to receive some questions after today. Um, I, you and Justin, do you guys have a slide, or can you just quickly put up there what your email addresses are? Yes, yeah. folks. I've got it. It should be the next slide. Yeah, there we go. There we are. Here we go. So at the beginning of the seminar, someone said if you need a receipt or a certificate for attending the, cl oh, uh -huh, the class to email someone, who is that person again? That is Michelle Peterson. My email is in the chat box. Yep. And Peterson at empirejustice.org. Yep. And while um, we're ending the webinar, um, the CLE code is also in the chat box. And it is G is in George. 1783. So that's G is in George, 1783. And the next question that was sent out, you guys, um, everybody should have received the materials at this point. Uh, if you, for some reason, didn't get a copy of them, um, contact Michelle and she can resend them to you. And the slides, I believe, um, Justin and Aisha, I believe the slides came in the form of of a PowerPoint, or did they come in the form of PDF? PDF. In the PowerPoint. The slides are in the PowerPoint, and we supplemented with the PDF about Neighborhood Watch. OK, so to Carol, hopefully that helps. Any uh, substantive questions on, on the topic or other questions? Do we just blow you guys all away with all that information in 60 minutes? <laughs> I think so, guys, yes. <laughs> <laughs> And, you know, I think part of it, too, is that some folks, you know, upstate, I don't know that we see that flipping as much nowadays. Um, so it may not be as obvious for folks to be looking for these kinds of issues. Mm -hmm. um, but there's, you know, typically what I have found is that when things start in the city, in New York City, they, within a, a couple of years, they creep their way into the rest of the state. So um, maybe you're not seeing some of these issues crop up any recently, um, but stay tuned. Okay, well, I don't see any other questions, so um, with that, thank you everybody for your time today, and um, thank you, of course, Justin and Aisha for a very um, intense hour on, with lots of information, so thank you both, and everybody have a nice afternoon. <laughs>